Dick Tracy Dick Tracy is an American comic strip featuring Dick Tracy, a tough and intelligent police detective created by Chester Gould. The strip made its debut on October 14, 1931, in the Detroit Mirror. It was distributed by the Chicago Tribune New York News Syndicate. Gould wrote and drew the strip until 1972. Since that time, various artists and writers have continued the strip, which still runs in newspapers today. Dick Tracy has also been the hero in a number of films, notably one in which Warren Beatty played the crime fighter in 1990. Writer Tom DeHaven praised Gould's Dick Tracy as a weird, demented, and outrageously funny American Gothic, while comics historian Brian Walker described Dick Tracy as a ghoulishly entertaining creation which had gripping stories filled with violence and pathos. Gould drafted an idea for a detective named Plain Clothes Tracy and sent it to Joseph Medill Patterson of the Chicago Tribune New York News Syndicate. Patterson suggested changing the hero's name to Dick Tracy, and also put forward an opening storyline in which Tracy joined the police after his girlfriend's father was murdered by robbers. Gould agreed to these ideas, and Dick Tracy was first published on October 4, 1931. The strip was instantly popular, and was soon appearing in newspapers across the United States. The strip's popularity also resulted in the creation of numerous Dick Tracy merchandise, including novelizations, toys, and games. In April 1937, a poll of adult comic strip readers in Fortune magazine voted Dick Tracy their third favorite comic strip. However, Dick Tracy was also attacked by some journalists as being too violent, a criticism that would dog Gould throughout his time on the strip. Tracy uses forensic science, advanced gadgetry, and wits in an early example of the police procedural mystery story, although stories often end in gunfights just the same. Stories typically follow a criminal committing a crime and Tracy's relentless pursuit of said criminal. The strip's most popular villain was Flattop Jones, a freelance hitman hired by black marketeers to murder Tracy. When Flattop was killed, fans went into public mourning. The Flattop story was reprinted in limited collector's edition in 1975. The villain's small crimes led to bigger, out-of-control situations, reflecting film noir. Similarly, innocent witnesses were frequently killed, and Tracy's paramour Tess Trueheart was often endangered by the villains. As the story progressed, Tracy adopted an orphan under the name Dick Tracy Jr., or Jr. for short, who appeared in investigations until becoming a police forensic artist in his father's precinct. He also cultivated a professional partner, ex-steelworker Pat Patton who gradually became a detective of skill and courage enough to satisfy Tracy's requirements. Tracy characters were often caricatures of celebrities. There was Breathless Mahoney, modeled after Veronica Lake. Likewise, B.O. Plenty was inspired by George Gabby Hayes, Vitamin Flint Heart by John Barrymore, and Spike Dyke by Spike Jones. Others include villains like Rughead, Oodles and Mumbles. Gould even parodied himself as the out-of-shape pear shape. On January 13, 1946, the two-way wrist radio became one of the strip's most immediately recognizable icons, worn as a wristwatch by Tracy and members of police force. This radio wristwatch inspired Martin Cooper's invention of the smartphone, and may have inspired later smartwatches. The two-way wrist radio was upgraded to a two-way wrist TV in 1964. This development also led to the introduction of an important supporting character, Diet Smith an eccentric industrialist who financed the development of this equipment. In a conspicuous coincidence, the idea of a radio built into a wristwatch played an important role in the storyline of Superman, the talking cat broadcast on the mutual broadcasting system on January 9 through 28, 1946. In late 1948, a botched security detail led to the death of the semi-regular character Brilliant, the blind inventor of the two-way wrist radio whereupon Chief Brandon. Dick Tracy's superior on the police force and a presence in the strip since 1931, resigned in shame and Pat Patton was promoted to police chief in Brandon's place, previously having been Tracy's buffoonish partner. A new character was introduced named Sam Ketchum to take Patton's place as Tracy's sidekick. Gould introduced topical storylines about television, juvenile delinquency, graft, organized crime and other developments in American life during the 1950s, and elements of soap opera depicted Dick, Tess, and Junior at home as a family. Depictions of family life alternated with the story's crime drama, as in the kidnapping of Bonnie Braids by fugitive Cruy Lou, or Junior's girlfriend model being accidentally killed by her brother. Gould incurred some controversy when he had Tracy live in an unaccountably ostentatious manner on a police officer's salary, 
and responded with a story wherein Tracy was accused of corruption and had to explain the origin of his possessions in detail. In his book-length examination of the strip, Dick Tracy, the official biography, J. Mader suggested that Gould's critics were unsatisfied by his explanation. Nevertheless, the controversy eventually faded, and the cartoonist reduced exposure to Tracy's home life. Tracy's cases generally incriminated independent operators rather than organized crime, with a few exceptions, such as Big Boy, a fictionalized version of Al Capone and the strip's first villain. Tracy opposed a series of big-time mobsters in the 1950s, such as The King, George Mr. Prime Alpha, Odds Zone, and Willie the Fifth Million, after events like the Kefalver hearings. As Tess faded into the background, Tracy assumed as his assistant rookie policewoman Liz Worthington. From 1956 to 1964, the Dick Tracy Sunday page was accompanied by a topper humor strip called The Gravies and drawn by Gould and his assistants. As technology progressed, the methods that Tracy and the police used to track and capture criminals took the form of increasingly fanciful atomic power ad gadgets developed by Diet Smith Industries. This eventually led to the 1960s advent of the Space Coupe, a spacecraft with a magnetic propulsion system. This marked the beginning of the strip's space period, which saw Tracy and friends having adventures on the moon and meeting Moon Maid, the daughter of the leader of the race of humanoid people living in Moon Valley in 1964. After an eventual sharing of technological information, moon technology became standard issue on Tracy's police force, including air cars, flying cylindrical vehicles. The villains became even more exaggerated in power, resulting in an escalating series of stories that no longer resembled the urban crime drama roots of the strip. During this period, Tracy met famed cartoonist Chet Jade, creator of the comic strip Sawdust, in which the only characters are talking dots. One of the new characters, Mr. Intro, was only manifested as a disembodied voice. His goal was world domination in the vein of a James Bond villain. Tracy eventually used an atomic laser beam to annihilate Intro and his island base. Junior married Moon Maid in October 1964. Their daughter Honeymoon Tracy had antennae and magnetic hands. In the spring of 1969, Tracy was offered the post of chief of police in Moon Valley. However, he ended up back on Earth when the Apollo 11 mission in 1969 showed that the moon was barren of all life. Many of the accoutrements of the space period stories remained for many years afterward, such as the space coupe and much of the high-tech gadgetry. Moon Maid receded from the storyline. The stories of this period took an increasingly condemnatory tone pertaining to contemporary court decisions concerning the rights of the accused, which often involved Tracy being frustrated by legal technicalities. For example, having caught a gang of diamond thieves red-handed, Tracy was forced to let them walk because he could not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the diamonds were stolen. As he saw the thieves get off without penalty, Tracy was heard to grumble, yes, under today's interpretation of the laws, it seems it's the police who are handcuffed. In the 1970s, Gould modernized Tracy by giving him a longer hairstyle and mustache, and added a hippie sidekick, Groovy Grove. Groovy's first appearance in print, as it happened, occurred during the same week as the Kent State shootings. Groovy remained with the strip, off and on until his death in 1984. Shortly before his retirement, Gould drew a strip in which Sam, Liz, and Groovy held Tracy down to shave off his mustache. At this time, the standard publication size and space of newspaper comics was sharply reduced, for example, the Dick Tracy Sunday strip which had traditionally been a full-page episode containing 12 panels, was cut in size to a half-page format that offered, at most, eight panels. These new restrictions created challenges for all comic artists. The Plenty family was a group of goofy redneck yokels headed by the former villain Bob Oscar, along with Gertrude Plenty. Gravel Gertie was introduced as the unwitting dupe of the villain The Brow, who was on the run from Dick Tracy. The family provided a humorous counterpoint to Tracy's adventures. The Plenty substory was decades long, and saw Sparkle Plenty grow from an infant to a young married lady, eventually becoming a beautiful fashion model. Sparkle Plenty's May 30, 1947 birth became a significant mainstream media event, with spin-off merchandising and magazine coverage. The Plenty family appeared with Tracy in a story that occurred in a bank, where Bio found a way to prevent thieves from snatching an envelope of money from a counter. In the April 24, 2011 strip, Bio and Gertie had a second child, Attitude, a boy who is as ugly as Sparkle is beautiful. His face has yet to be shown. Beginning in the early 1950s, 
The Sunday strip included a frame devoted to a page from the Crime Stoppers textbook, a series of handy illustrated hints for the amateur crime fighter. This was named after a short-lived youth group seen in the strip during the late 1940s, led by Junior Tracy, called Dick Tracy's Crime Stoppers. This feature ended when Gould retired from the strip in 1977, but Max Allen Collins reinstated it, and it is still part of the comic strip. After Gould's retirement, Collins initially replaced the textbook with Dick Tracy's Rogues Gallery, a salute to memorable Tracy villains of the past. Chester Gould retired from comics in 1977. His last Dick Tracy strip appeared in print on Sunday, December 25th of that same year. The following Monday, Dick Tracy was taken over by Max Allen Collins and longtime Gould's assistant Rick Fletcher. Gould's name remained in the byline for a few years after his retirement as a story consultant. In one of Collins' first stories as the strip's writer, the gangster known as Big Boy learned that he was dying and had less than a year to live. Big Boy was still seeking revenge on the plain clothesman who sent him up the river and he wanted to live just long enough to see Tracy's death. He put out an open contract on Tracy's head worth $1 million, knowing that every small-time hood in the city would take a crack at the famous cop for that amount of money. One of the would-be collectors rigged Tracy's car to explode, but inadvertently killed Moon Maid instead of Tracy in the explosion. A funeral strip for Moon Maid explicitly stated that this officially severed all ties between Earth and the Moon in the strip, thus eliminating the last remnants off the space period. Honeymoon received a new hairstyle that covered her antennae, and she was ultimately phased out of the strip. Junior later married Sparkle Plenty, and had a daughter named Sparkle Plenty Jr. In the 1990s, Tracy's son Joseph Flint Hart Tracy took on a role similar to Junior's in the earlier strips. In addition, Collins removed other Gould creations of the 1960s and 1970s. On a more philosophical level, Collins took a generally less cynical view of the justice system than Gould. Tracy came to accept its limitations and requirements as a normal part of the process which he could manage. Extreme technology was phased out, such as the space coupe, in favor of more realistic advanced tools such as the two-way wrist computer in 1987. New semi-regular characters introduced by Collins and Fletcher included, Dr. Will Carver, a plastic surgeon with underworld ties who often worked on known felons, Wendy Witchell a smarmy newspaper reporter slash editorialist with a strong anti-Tracy bias in her articles, and Lee Ebony, an African-American female detective. Vitamin Flint Hart reappeared occasionally as a comic relief figure, the aged ham actor created by Gould in 1944 who had not been seen in the strip for almost three decades. The Plenty family were also brought back as semi-regulars, Junior and Sparkle were married following the death of Moon Maid, and soon gave birth to their own daughter Sparkle Plenty Jr. Original villains seen during this period included Angel Top, Torture, and Split Screen. Collins brought back at least one classic Gould villain or revenge-seeking family member per year. The revived Gould villains were often provided with full names, and marriages, children, and other family connections were developed, bringing more humanity to many of the originally grotesque brutes. Flat Top, particularly, had a number of relatives, all with his characteristic head structure and facial attributes who turned up one by one to avenge their ancestor on Tracy. Rick Fletcher died in 1983 and was succeeded by editorial cartoonist Dick Locker, who had assisted Gould on the strip in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Locker was assisted by his son John, who died in 1986. Max Allen Collins was fired from the strip in 1992, following a financial reorganization of their comic strip holdings, and Tribune staff writer and columnist Mike Killian took over the writing. Killian was paid less than half of what Collins was making per strip, but continued until his death on October 27, 2005. Locker was both author and artist for over three years, beginning on January 9, 2006. On March 16, 2009, Jim Brosman began collaborating with Locker, taking over the drawing duties while Locker continued to write the strip. In 2005, Tracy was a guest at Blondie and Dagwood's 75th anniversary party in the comic strip Blondie. Later, Dick Tracy appeared in the comic strip Gasoline Alley. On January 19, 2011, Tribune Media Services announced that Locker was retiring from the strip and handing the reins to artist Joe Staten and writer Mike Curtis. The new creative team has previously worked together on Scooby Doo, Richie Rich, and Casper the Friendly Ghost. Their first Dick Tracy strip was published March 14, 2011. Staten and Curtis are assisted by Shelley Pledger, who inks and letters Staten's drawings along with Shane Fisher, who provides the coloring on the Sunday strips.
Chicago Area Police Sergeant Jim Doherty provided Crime Stopper captions for the Sunday strips and acted as the feature's technical advisor. Doherty also introduced a new feature, Tracy's Hall of Fame, in which a real life police officer is profiled and honored. Doherty was replaced in 2016 by Police Lieutenant Walter Reimer, who introduced the First Responders Roll of Honor, which honors real life police officers, firefighters, and paramedics who died on duty. Staten and Curtis reintroduced many of the characters of the 40s through the 60s, including a second Mr. Crime and a reformed mole, while introducing more deformed and grotesque villains such as Abner Cadaver, Panda, and the Jumbler. They have also brought back all the gadgets and plot elements of the 1960s space era, starting in early 2013, although the reintroduced Moon Maid is not the same as the original, rather, she is a human genetically modified to resemble the original Moon Maid and thus, is Chris and Mr. Chimera and placed under Diet Smith's care. They have also done crossovers, with cameos from Popeye, Brenda Starr, Reporter, Funky Winkerbean, Fearless Fostick, The Spirit, The Green Hornet, For Better or For Worse, and a long sequence involving Little Orphan Annie. Chester Gould won the Rubin Award for the strip in 1959 and 1977. The Mystery Writers of America honored Gold and his work with a special Edgar Award in 1980. This was the first time MWA ever honored a comic strip. In 1995, the strip was one of 20 included in the comic strip classics series of commemorative postage stamps and postcards. On May 2, 2011, the Tennessee Senate passed Resolution 30, congratulating Mike Curtis and Joe Staten on their professional accomplishments, including Dick Tracy. On September 7, 2013, at the Baltimore Comics Convention, Dick Tracy was awarded the Harvey in the Best Syndicated Strip or Panel category. Tracy was simultaneously the oldest continually running strip, and the first adventure strip ever to win the Harvey Award in this category. On September 6, 2014, Tracy was awarded a second Harvey Award in the newspaper strip category, becoming one of only three strips to win in this category in consecutive years. On September 26, 2015, Tracy won a third Harvey in the same category becoming one of only three strips to win in three consecutive years. On November 6, 2016 at their panel at Akron Comic-Con, Mike Curtis and Joe Staten were each presented with an Akron Comic-Con Excellence Award. The inscription on the plaques reads, 2016 Akron Comic-Con Excellence Award presented to Mike Curtis and Joe Staten for their contribution to one of the longest-running newspaper strips in the history of newspaper comics. Dick Tracy had a long run on radio. From 1934 weekdays on NBC's New England stations to the ABC network in 1948. Bob Berlin was the first radio Tracy in 1934, and others heard in the role during the 1930s and 1940s were Barry Thompson, Ned Weaver, and Matt Crowley. The early shows all had 15 minute episodes. On CBS, with Sterling Products as sponsor, the serial aired four times a week from February 4, 1935 to July 11, 1935 moving to Mutual from September 30, 1935 to March 24, 1937 with Bill McClintock doing the sound effects. NBC's weekday afternoon run from January 3, 1938 to April 28, 1939 had sound effects be Keen Crockett and was sponsored by Quaker Oats, which brought Dick Tracy into primetime with 30-minute episodes from April 29, 1939 to September 30, 1939. The series returned to 15-minute episodes on the ABC Blue Network from March 15, 1943 to July 16, 1948, sponsored by Tootsie Roll, which used the music theme of Toot Toot, Tootsie for its 30-minute Saturday ABC series from October 6, 1945 to June 1, 1946. Sound effects on ABC were supplied by Walt McDonough and Al Finelli. On February 15, 1945, Command Performance broadcast the musical comedy Dick Tracy in B-flat with Bing Crosby as Tracy, Bob Hope as Flat Top, Dinah Shore as Tess Trueheart, among the cast. Dick Tracy's wedding is repeatedly interrupted as Tracy chases after one villain after another dot in the strip, his marriage wasn't until 1950 and his honeymoon was disrupted by his going after Wormy. Jim Amici portrayed Tracy in a two-record set recorded by Mercury Records in 1947. The record sleeves were illustrated with Sunday strips reprinted in black and white for children to color. Tracy made his first comic book appearance in 1936 as one of the features included in the first issue of Dell's popular comics. These were reprints from the newspaper strip, 
reconfigured to fit the pages of a comic book, as was the case with most Tracy comic book appearances. Tracy remained a regular feature in popular comics through the publication's 21st issue. The first comic book to feature Tracy exclusively was the Dick Tracy feature book, published in May 1937 by David McKay Publications. McKay's feature books were magazines that rotated several popular characters from comic strips through 1938. Three more of McKay's feature books starred Tracy in the following months. In 1939, Dell started a comic magazine series called Black and White Comics, essentially identical to McKay's feature books. Six of the 15 issues featured Tracy. In 1941, Dell's Black and White series was replaced by the large feature books, the third issue of which featured Tracy. As with the McKay series, the Dell Black and White and Large Feature series were abridged reprints of the strip. In 1938, Tracy became one of several regular newspaper strips featured in Dell's regular monthly super comics, remaining a regular part of that publication until 1948. In 1939, Tracy was the sole feature in the very first issue of Dell's Four Color Comics, which put out more than 1,300 issues starring hundreds of characters between 1939 and 1962. Tracy was featured in seven more Four Color issues throughout the 1940s. Tracy was frequently featured in comic books used as promotional items by various companies. In 1947, for example, Sig Feuchtbanger produced a comic book that was a giveaway prize in boxes of Quaker Puff Wheat cereal, sponsor of the popular Dick Tracy radio series. In January 1948, Dell began the first regular Dick Tracy comic book series, Dick Tracy Monthly. This series ultimately ran for 145 issues the first 24 of which were published by Dell, after which it was picked up by Harvey Comics. Continuing the same numbering, Harvey published the series until 1961. As with most previous Tracy comic book incarnations, these were, with the exception of the last few Dell issues which featured original material, slightly abridged and reconfigured reprints of the newspaper strips. Dick Tracy was revived in 1986 by Blackthorn Publishing and ran for 99 issues. Disney produced a series of three issues as a tie-in for their 1990 film. This miniseries, True Hearts and Tommy Guns, was drawn by Kyle Baker and edited by Len Wein. The third issue was a direct adaptation of the film. In 2018, IDW Publishing announced a new Dick Tracy comic book by Mike Allred, Lee Allred, Rich Tommaso and Laura Allred. Over the years, many reprints of Dick Tracy newspaper strips have been published. Beginning in 2006, IDW Publishing started reprinting the complete striping hardcover volumes, eventually being done under their The Library of American Comics imprint. Other collections include Other editions, Dick Tracy made his film debut in Dick Tracy, a 15-chapter movie serial by Republic Pictures starring Ralph Bird. The Spider Gang was on the loose, tired of Dick Tracy's cunning skills. Through the 15-chapter serial, 15 different cases were solved. All plots by the Spider Gang. Dick Tracy was also in search of his missing brother, Gordon Tracy. The Dick Tracy character proved very popular, and a second serial, Dick Tracy Returns, appeared in 1938. Dick Tracy's G-Men was released in 1939. The last was Dick Tracy vs. Crime Incorporated in 1941. The sequels were produced under an interpretation of the contract for the first Dick Tracy serial, which gave license for a series or serial. As a result, Chester Gould received no further money for the sequel serials. In these serials, Dick Tracy is portrayed as an FBI agent, or G-Man, based in California rather than as a detective in the police force of a Midwestern city resembling Chicago, and, aside from himself and Junior, no characters from the strip appear in any of the four films. However, comic relief sidekick Mike McGurk bears some resemblance to Tracy's partner from the strip, Pat Patton. Tracy's secretary, Gwen Andrews, provides the same kind of feminine interest as Tess Trueheart, and FBI Director Clive Anderson is the same kind of avuncular superior as Chief Brandon. The first serial, Dick Tracy, is now in the public domain. Six years after the release of the final Republic serial, Dick Tracy headlined four feature films, produced by RKO Radio Pictures. Dick Tracy was followed by Dick Tracy vs. Cuball in 1946 both with Morgan Conway as Tracy. Ralph Bird returned for the last two features, both released in 1947, Dick Tracy's Dilemma and Dick Tracy Meets Gruesome. Gruesome is probably the best known of the four, with the villain portrayed by Boris Karlov. 
All four movies had many of the visual features associated with film noir, dramatic, shadowy photographic compositions, with many exterior scenes filmed at night. Lyle Attell co-starred in all four films as Pat Patton. And Jeffries played Tess Truhart in the first two, succeeded by Kay Christopher and finally Anne Gwynn. Ian Keith joined the cast as the actor Vitamin Flint Hart for two films, Joseph Crehan played Chief Brandon. RKO stocked the films with familiar faces, creating a veritable rogues gallery of characters, Mike Mazurki as Splitface, Dick Vessel as Q-Ball, Esther Howard as Filthy Flora, Jack Lambert as hook hand Bill villain The Claw, Bald-Headed, Pop-Eyed Milton Parsons, Mild-Mannered Byron Folger, Dangerous Driver Bardet and Pockmarked, Gently Sinister Scalp and Nags. In 1990, Warren Beatty directed and starred as the title character in a live-action all-star cast film along with Al Pacino, Dustin Hoffman, and Madonna. The strip has had limited exposure on television with one early live-action series, two animated series, one unsold pilot that was never picked up, and a proposed TV series currently held up in litigation. Ralph Bird, who had played the square-jawed sleuth in all four Republic movie serials, and in two of the RKO feature-length films, reprised his role in a short live live-action Dick Tracy series that ran on ABC from 1950 to 1951. Additional episodes intended for first-run syndication continued to be produced into 1952. Produced by P.K. Palmer, who also wrote many of the scripts, the series often featured gold-created villains such as Flattop, Shaky, The Mole, Breathless Mahoney, Heels Beals, and Influence, all of whom appeared on film for the first time on this series. Other cast members included Joe Devlin as Sam Catchum, Angela Green as Tess Tracy, Martin Dean as Jr., and Pierre Watkin as Chief Patton. Criticized for its violence, the series remained popular. It ended, not in response to criticism, but because of Bird's unexpected, premature death in 1952. The series was filmed on a low budget, with many long hours and a rushed shooting schedule. Many episodes of this series have been released on various public domain TV detective DVD sets. The first cartoon series was produced from 1960 to 1961 by UPA. Tracy employed a series of cartoon-like subordinate flatfoots to fight crime each week, contacting them on his two-way wrist radio. Eric Sloan voiced Tracy and supporting characters and villains were voiced by Jerry Hausner, Mel Blanc, Benny Rubin, Johnny Coons, Paul Fries and others. These subordinates included Go-Go Gomez, Joe Jitsu, Hemlock Holmes and the Retouchables, and Officer Hippo Calorie. 135-minute cartoons were designed and packaged for syndication, usually intended for local children's shows. Uba was also the production company behind the Mr. Magoo cartoons, so it was possible for them to arrange a meeting between Tracy and Magoo in a 1965 episode of the season-long TV series The Famous Adventures of Mr. Magoo. In the episode Dick Tracy and the Mob, Tracy persuades Magoo to impersonate an international hitman named Squinty Eyes, who he resembles, and infiltrate a gang of criminals made up of Flattop, Pruneface, Itchy, Mumbles and others. Unlike the earlier animated Tracy shorts, this longer episode was played relatively straight, with Tracy getting much more screen time. Pitting Tracy against a coalition of several of his foes was adopted more than two decades later in the 1990 film. A second cartoon series was produced in 1971 and was a feature in Archie's TV Funnies, produced by Filmation. It adhered more closely to the comic strip, although it was hampered by cruder animation than the UPA shorts, typical of the studio's production standards. William Dozier produced a pilot for a live-action Dick Tracy series in 1967 starring Ray McDonnell in the title role. The pilot was the plot to kill NATO, featuring special guest villain Victor Buono as Mr. Dot Memory. The quality was slightly above average, but the series was not purchased by either ABC or NBC, as ratings for the Batman series were dropping onto similar series featuring the Green Hornet had recently flopped. To the networks, the hero camp or Batmania craze was dying, and they chose not to take a risk on another series. The pilot is notable for a phantom credit. Eve Plum, who would later find fame as Jan Brady on The Brady Bunch, is credited for a character named Bonnie Braids, who does not appear in the pilot. In the 1960s, Aurora produced a plastic model kit of Dick Tracy sliding down a fire escape ladder into an alley, in hot pursuit with gun drawn. A Dick Tracy space coupe model came next. Both have been reissued by Polar Lights. Also in the market were Mattel's Dick Tracy range of toy guns. In 1990, Playmates Toys released a line of action figures called Dick Tracy, 
coppers and gangsters to coincide with the Dick Tracy movie. The figures were 5 inches tall, stylized with exaggerated commissy looks and came with lots of accessories. Two figures in the line had limited availability. Steve the Tramp was pulled from the assortment after complaints of portrayal of a homeless person as a criminal. The figure of the blank was added to the assortment well after the film's release to keep the secret of the identity of the character. As a result, only limited quantities of these two figures made it to store shelves. The Dick Tracy video game was developed by Titus Software in 1990. It was ported to many platforms including Amiga, Commodore and MS-DOS. Dick Tracy is a side-scrolling action shooting game. The player controls Dick Tracy through five stages. There were also games made for the Nintendo Entertainment System, Sega Master System, Sega Genesis, and Game Boy. In 2009, Shocker Toys released a monochromatic Dick Tracy action figure as an exclusive product for the San Diego Comic Con. The figure appears in a suit with two way wrist radio. There was also a variant figure released of Dick Tracy in his signature trench coat and fedora with a Tommy gun accessory. Media outlets reported a legal battle being waged over rights to the Dick Tracy character. Warren Beatty announced plans to make a sequel to his 1990 movie. At the same time, television producers announced plans for a new Dick Tracy TV series. Both sides claimed that they were the legal owners of the rights to Dick Tracy. In May 2005, Beatty sued the Tribune Company, claiming he has owned the rights to the Dick Tracy character since 1985. Pressure from Beatty led to the cancellation of a proposed collaboration between artist Mike Oming and writer Brian Bendis on a new serialized Dick Tracy comic. The lawsuit was resolved in Beatty's favor, with a U.S. district judge ruling that Beatty did everything contractually required of him to keep the rights to that character. Notes Bibliography Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.